Good morning. We're about to start. Raise your hand if you're able to hear me clearly. All right, that's good enough. <clears throat> All right, this morning we'll be reviewing the BLS chapter and we'll be looking at um, some skills review as well. All right, <clears throat> introduction. The principles of basic life support BLS were introduced in 1960. Specific techniques have been revised every five to six years. The most recent review was conducted by the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation or ILCOR. Elements of BLS. It's a non-invasive emergency life-saving um, procedure. It is used to treat medical conditions, including airway obstruction, respiratory arrest, and cardiac arrest. It can also be indicated for a patient who has massive traumatic injuries and is in cardiac arrest. It focuses on ABCs, airway obstruction, respiratory arrest, which is no breathing, and cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest, which the heart stops, but technically the heart is still moving due to fibrillation. And of course, if there is severe blood loss, the patient can go into cardiac arrest as well. Ideally, only seconds should pass between the time you recognize a patient's needs, a patient needs BLS, and start your treatment. Permanent brain damage is possible if the brain goes without oxygen for four to six minutes. These are things we already know. Time is critical. Time is brain, time is heart. Zero to one minute without adequate perfusion results in cardiac irritability. Zero to four minutes, brain damage is not likely. Four to six minutes without proper oxygenation, brain damage is possible. Six to 10 minutes without proper oxygenation, brain damage is very likely. And after 10 minutes without proper perfusion to the brain can result in irreversible brain damage. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Used to establish circulation and artificial ventilation in a patient who is not breathing and has no pulse. That's for your adult patient. In your pediatric population, infants and newborn, Newborns, we do not wait until they are pulseless to start chest compression. We start comp chest compression once they are showing signs of bradycardia. So adults, it's pulseless. For infants and newborns or neonates, it's going to be a pulse that is below 60 that we would start chest compression. CPR steps restore circulation, and the steps that res restore or mimic circulation is going to be the chest compression. Two, we open the ear with three, re restore breathing and provide rescue breathing. Rescue breathing is going to be necessary if the patient has a pulse, but they are not breathing. No, you have to incorporate your EMT skills and equipment into your CPR 
sequence. So if you're using a BVM, you should be considering the use of a, of a airway adjunct and you should have suction available if it is necessary. BLS differs from advanced life support, the difference. No, ALS or ACLS is gonna involve um, using advanced procedures to secure the upper airway, IV access, creating IV access to run fluids and medication and um, using dynamic cardiology to recognize rhythms and provide the most appropriate treatment based on the type of rhythms because it's only two rhythms that will respond to defibrillation, ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia with no pulse. The chain of survival. So for CPR to be effective anywhere in the world, there must be early recognition and activation of EMS. The person that contacted EMS must initiate high quality CPR or layperson CPR before BLS is available. And if necessary too, depending on the location, they should be able to access a defibrillator, right? So the person that contacts EMS must initiate CPR prior to BLS and the ACLS arrival. So we need early recognition, early CPR, rapid defibrillation, early basic and advanced EMS response, and then the patient is gonna need early definitive care in the hospital setting. AHA, or American Heart Association Chain of Survival, recognition and activation of the emergency response system, immediate high quality CPR, rapid defibrillation, basic and advanced emergency medical services, advanced life support and post arrest care in the hospital setting. If any one of the links in the chain is absent, the patient is more likely to die, right? So once a link is missing, the patient chances of survival decrease significantly. Assessing the need for BLS, always begin by surveying the scene, complete your primary assessment as soon as possible, evaluate ABCs, determine the patient's unresponsiveness, responsive patient does not need CPR. Basic principles of BLS are the same for infants, children, and adults with a few tweaks. Although cardiac arrest is, in adults is usually, usually occur before respiratory arrest, the reverse is true for infants and children. So this is an important point. So majority of the cardiac arrest that occurs in the adult population is gonna be because of some issue with the patient's heart. The pediatric population will go into cardiac arrest because of respiratory issues. So that is what is going to kill them, respiratory problems. So first step is, <clears throat> After taking a standard precaution and ensuring that your scene is safe and you approach a patient, you check the patient's level of consciousness. Does not respond to your voice, you apply pain. Patient is not responding to pain, you have a patient that is unresponsive. Simultaneously position the airway and check the pulse for at least um, five to 10 seconds. So it should not be less than five seconds. It should exceed 10 seconds. Automated external defibrillation. It is an important link in the chain of survival. So CPR is just buying time until an AED is available. 
it should be applied to a cardiac arrest patient as soon as available. If you witness cardiac arrest, begin CPR and apply AED, uh, the AED as soon as it is available. Children, apply the first five cycles of CPR. So the difference with your um, pediatric population. If, if it is, because they need early um, basic life support and the ALS, you will consider completing the first five cycle cycles of CPR based on the patient presentation and history. And um, the manual defibrillator is preferred for infants one month to one year. If unavailable, then you use your pediatric size pads and dose attenuating system. If NIDA is available, then use an AED with adult size pads. The most important thing to note when using AED pads for a pediatric population is to not allow the, the AED pads to touch each other. So they shouldn't be touching each other when you apply it on the patient. So if you're considering to use an AED for a pediatric patient, do at least two minutes of CPR first. Special situations. Now patients may have in pacemakers and implanted defibrillators <clears throat> and they might be wet or have water on them and they may be wearing a transdermal medication patch. Positioning the patient. For CPR to be effective, patient must be supine on a firm, flat surface. So you need a flat surface. Some units carry what is called a CPR board. You can use a sharp board, you can use a KED. Some of the stretchers now that are being put out are quite rigid enough but it's a very important that you have a flat surface. So if the patient is on a bed and the bed is off, you don't want to start CPR with the patient on the bed. You need to get them to a flat surface. And as I said, the options are your CPR board, your KED or sharp bat board. You can use a long bat board as well, but you need a flat surface must be enough space for two rescuers, rescuers to perform CPR. So you should have enough room to um, move around the patient. Log roll the patient onto a long backboard if it is necessary. All right, check breathing and pulse. So simultaneously, check for breathing and pulse. Quickly check for breathing and pulse. Visualize the chest for signs of breathing. Palpate for the carotid pulse in your adult and child population. If it's an infant, then it's a brachial pulse. No less than five seconds, no greater than 10 seconds. Provide external chest compression. So if the patient is not breathing and there is no pulse, adult population, start your chest compressions. If it's the, the infant, neonate, newborn, the pulse must be below 60 beats per minute. Apply rhythmic pressure and relaxation to the lower half of the sternum. Once you start chest compression, the first 10 chest compression doesn't push the blood anywhere. So the, the first 10 is not gonna push the blood very far. It basically warms up the heart. <clears throat> so it's prepping the heart to be able to stretch further. The last 20 chest compressions it will be the ones that push the, the blood where it needs to go. 
So what that means is if you start chest compression, you can't pause, right? You're gonna lose that momentum and you're gonna have to rebuild that momentum. So you should um, limit interruptions of your chest compression. It has to be consistent. So apply rhythmic pressure and relaxation to the lower half of, of the sternum. The heart is located slightly to the left of the middle of the chest between the sternum and the spine. Compression squeeze the heart, acting as a pump to circulate the blood. Allow the chest to complete the recoil between chest compression. So when you compress the chest, you have to allow it to naturally come back up. If you don't, the blood won't go where it needs to go. So proper hand positioning is crucial. Injuries can be minimized by proper technique and hand, hand, place, uh, hand placement, sorry. So it can be minimized. It doesn't mean that if your technique is good, injuries can't occur. So even with good technique, injuries can occur. All right, now, do you know your techniques for opening the airway? You have your head tilt, chin lift, no spinal injury suspected. That's the one you go with. Jaw thrust maneuver is for patients that you suspect spinal injury. If your jaw thrust maneuver is not effective, then you'll do what is referred to as a controlled head tilt chin lift. If you determine that the patient is adequately breathing and there are no signs, adequately breathing and there are no signs, of injury to the head, spine, hip, or pelvis, place a patient in the recovery position. The recovery position maintains a clear airway that allows vomitors to drain from the mouth, roll the patient as a unit. So recovery position is for the patient that is unresponsive, no signs of trauma, or indication of spinal injury, and they have adequate chest rise. So you turn them on their side to keep the tongue out of the ear passage. The combination of lack of oxygen and too much carbon dioxide in the blood is lethal. Provide slow, deliberate, sorry, provide slow, deliberate ventilations that last one second. So it's 30 compressions to two breaths. Squeeze, squeeze. <clears throat> That's CPR ventilations. The difference between um, CPR ventilations and rescue breathing is rescue breathing is one breath every three to five, sorry, every five to six seconds for an adult, one breath every three to five seconds for a pediatric patient. When we're doing CPR ventilation, it is two breaths. It's 30 compressions to two breaths. And it's squeeze, squeeze. One, two. If the patient is not breathing, ventilations can be given by one or two EMS providers. Use a barrier device. And you have options for that. You have your pocket mask, you have your BVM. You need to be comfortable using a BVM. Pocket mask will be required if your BVM vent ventilations are not effective. As soon as an oxygen source is available, have it attached to your BVM. You want a flow rate of 15 liters per minute. Once airway adjuncts are available, Earway adjuncts should be utilized. So if you have the earway adjunct, use the earway adjunct. For a patient with a stoma, place a BVM or pocket mask device directly over the stoma. Artificial ventilations may result in gastric distension, meaning the stomach becomes filled with air. 
When you're do breathing for a patient through a stoma, you don't need to position the airway to do that. If you're breathing for a patient with a BVM and the airway is not properly positioned and the technique is too forceful, you will push air past the air passage into the stomach and that can make ventilations become very difficult for your patient. Always have your suction unit available in case patient vomits or stuff start to, stuff start to come up in the ear passage. So again, your EMT skills and equipment must be incorporated into the CPR process. And that is something that is kind of absent when you go to the Heart Foundation and you do your BLS course. The, these equipments are not incorporated into the CPR. And it needs to be incorporated into your practice for you to get accustomed to using them. All right, now one rescuer adult CPR. Single rescuer gives both chest compression and artificial ventilation. The ratio of compress compressions to ventilation is 30 to two. Always two rescue adult CPR, always preferable to one rescue, right? One person is gonna get more, get tired much more easily than two person. Ideally, what you want for a code is a three to four person team. So for CPR to really be effective in the pre-hospital, if you have three or four persons that are competent in the, the task, you will get much better results. So it's very difficult for two rescuers to run a code and run it effectively. Always prefer, so two rescuer adult CPR, always preferable to one rescuer CPR. Less tiring, rescuer doing compressions can, can be switched. It facilitates effective chest compressions. Switching rescuers during CPR is critical to maintain high quality compressions and recommended to switch position every two minutes. So it is recommended to, to switch every two minutes or you switch when you're tired so if you're tired you need to switch once you start to get tired the cpr the compressions will not be effective so if you feel tired and you know look like the the two minutes is close you need to switch when you're tired you can also switch when the AED is going to analyze the patient. So when it's analyzing the patient, you can switch at that point. And we have a method of prompting the person in terms of, I prep the person that, hey, I'm gonna be switching, right? And basically how that is done is for the first five, compressions that I'm starting for the new set of 30 is I will start off by saying we will switch next time six seven eight right so we will switch next time six seven eight nine ten and I go up to 30 when I get to 30 I put my fingers on the pulse while my partner at the head is giving the two ventilations. Then he moves into the compression position and I will tell him no pulse. So you will not start chest compressions until I tell him, okay, there's still no pulse, start chest compression. That's how we switch in the field. So you kind of stop, you have to kind of prompt your partner, hey, we're gonna be switching next time. So that's a way for me to switch without interrupting the rhythm of my compression. We will switch next time, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and you go up to 30. 
fingers on the pulse, so the compressor, put their fingers on the pulse, partner the head, give two breaths, move into compressor position. Person that has the two fingers on the pulse, no pulse, start chest compression, and then I move to the head of the patient to take over ventilations. No, and again, for this to be smooth, it has to be something that you are practicing. So if you're not getting codes on a regular basis, every three months, you should be doing drills for your, your CPR. Now, devices and techniques to assist circulation. Don't have a lot of these devices. So active compression, decompression, CPR. It involves compressing the chest, then actively pulling it back up in its neutral position. Not something that is currently being practiced in. Research is being done on that, so I won't say a lot on that. Impedance threshold device. It's a valve device placed between the endotracheal tube and a BVM. Basically, it can give us a, a reading on how well the patient is being perfused. It limits ear entering into the lungs during recoil phase between the chest compression. Again, not a device that you will see here in Jamaica. Not a device I have seen a lot in the first world system as well, but research is being done on these devices. Right, so this device on the chest, when you compress, this device that's on the chest, when you compress down and come up, it pulls the chest up, pulls it up. And the impedance threshold device ensures that you're not pushing excessive pressure into the lung. So these are devices that can be very beneficial when doing CPR. Now, mechanical piston device or compression device. It depresses the sternum via compressed gas powered or electric powered plunger. Loading distributing band CPR or vest CPR, a circumferential vest compression device composed of constricting band and a backboard. Manual chest compression remain the standard of care. So most services now will will have, especially when it's when ALS gets there, because how it works in the um proper EMS response system is EMTs would initiate CPR, BLS, and they would be doing manual chest compression with the use of an AED. When ALS comes and they need to take over, they are going to be using a compression device, which is very good for ALS providers because it frees up or hands that we can do IV access if necessary and give meds, or we can take over the airway with an advanced technique if needed. So it allows our hands to be free to focus on other things. And of course, you're, you don't get tired, right? You're not exhausted because physical chest compressions will exhaust you. So these devices are quite useful. The chest compression device is also beneficial if you need to move with the patient and CPR is still required. So you can travel with a patient and the device is on the patient doing the chest compressions for you. Instead of you in the back of the unit trying to physically do the chest compression, which research has shown that it's not effective and it's not safe for the providers. So that's what the compression device looks like. This is the auto pulse. This is the one I am familiar with and I have used in the field. Quite nice device, very nice. Um, there are others, but that's the one that is quite popular. 
Now, infant and child CPR. Cardiac arrest in infants and children follows respiratory arrest. Very important point. So the pediatric population will go into cardiac arrest because of respiratory problems. Airway and breathing are the focus of pediatric BLS. Causes of child respiratory problems. It can be injury, can be infections, it can be a foreign body, can be submersion, electrocution, poisoning, overdose, sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS. Determine the patient's level of responsiveness. Gently tap on the shoulder and speak loudly. Check for breathing and pulse simultaneously. Should take no longer than 10 seconds. It shouldn't be less than five seconds. And for your infant, it's gonna be the brachial pulse. For a child, it's a carotid. Foreign body obstruction in children is very common. Place an unresponsive breathing child in the recovery position. The techniques for opening the airway are slightly modified for your pediatric population. So the smaller the child is, the bigger their head is gonna be in, in um, proportion to the rest of their body. So if you put a small child flat, their head will naturally cause their neck to flex. So if it's a small child, like an infant, you're gonna have to elevate their shoulder. So you need to put some padding underneath the shoulder to get their head in what we would, be, would classify as sniffing position. Provide rescue breathing. And rescue breathing is necessary if the child or infant, so if it's a very young child or infant, and they have a pulse, and they are not breathing, one breath every three to five seconds. However, note, if it's an, an infant, and they have a pulse that is less than 100 beats per minute, but above 60, beats per minute, they will require assisted ventilation, whether they start to show signs of it or not. So let me repeat that. If it's a very small child or infant, specifically infants or newborns, if their pulse is less than 100 beats per minute, but above 60 beats per minute, they will require assisted ventilation, whether they start to show signs of it or not. So don't wait until they start to show signs that might be too late. If there is no breathing and no pulse, and again, for your infants, neonates or newborn, we do not wait for them to go pulseless. So once their pulse is less than 60, chest compressions will be required, right? So a pulse less than 60 with no breathing for an infant, newborn, neonate, they are gonna require um, CPR. And it's 30 compressions, to two breaths, if it's one person. If it's two rescuers, it's 15 to two, right? So it's 15 to two. So that would be 10 cycles within two minutes if it's two person. Interrupting CPR. CPR is crucial. It's a life-saving procedure. It provides minimal circulation and ventilations until patient can receive defibrillation, ALS treatment, and definitive care at the emergency department. If no, uh, if no ALS is available at scene, provide transport based on your protocols, which is kind of absent in Jamaica. Consider requesting ALS run, rendezvous en route to the hospital. <clears throat> and ideally, what you want, what we want in Jamaica is a three-person response team. And the reason why I'm saying 
three person is because we do not have compression devices in Jamaica. So that's not something I've seen. And I, it, that's not something I expect to see anytime soon either. So you're gonna have a, a conundrum where you have a patient that has coded and you need to transport that patient in the back of your unit and you may be required to do manual compression for that patient, which is, as I said, is not gonna be effective and it's not safe if it's, if it's, especially if it's just you alone around the back and your partner at the front. So having a third person would mean you have, there is two of you around the back. One person can focus on the ventilation while the other person focuses on chest compression and using the AED. Just keep in mind that if the AED indicates a shock, a shock should not be delivered while the unit is moving. <clears throat> Try not to interrupt CPR for more than a few seconds. And the rule of thumb is don't exceed 10 seconds in your interruption. Chest compression fraction. Total percentage of time during a resuscitation attempt in which compressions are being performed should be at least 60%. Not gonna go into all of the maths. The point is, as I said before, if you're going to stop CPR, don't exceed 10 seconds. As you're gonna have to rebuild your momentum. When not to start CPR. So when not to start CPR. If the scene is not safe, so we're not going to remain on a scene that's unsafe to do CPR for anybody. If the patient has obvious signs of death, we're not going to start CPR. So rigor mortis, which is stiffening of the body dependent lividity or liver mortis, which is where the body fluid start to settle in the lower portions of the body. Petrification or decomposition, basically the tissue starts to break down and rotten. Evidence of non-survivable -survival, injury. So if the injury is significant to the point that it's obvious this person will not su survive, then we're not gonna start CPR. Also, if a patient has been in cardiac arrest for more than 10 to 15 minutes and no CPR has been initiated, then CPR might not be done for that patient. Which comes back to the previous point. Whoever contacted EMS needs to start CPR before EMS arrive. It shouldn't be EMS come and start CPR. It need to be initiated prior to EMS arrival. So that's dependent lividity. If the patient and physician have previously agreed on do not resuscitate DNR orders, can be complicated, it can be a complicated issue for sure. Advanced directives expressing the patient's wishes may be hard to find. So you, you may have to so you might go respond and the patient has a DNR and they can't locate it, they have to search for it. During that, that period when they're looking for the device, you would only do BLS. So only BLS we would do for the, the patient until it is located. Once it's located and confirmed, then we would stop CPR at that point. So we wouldn't go into any ALS interventions, right? So the bottom line is when you're not sure, start CPR. When to stop CPR? Once you begin CPR, continue until we use the STOP acronym. The patient starts to breathe and has a pulse. T, the patient is transferred to another provider of equal or higher level of training. O, 
you are out of strength, so you're exhausted. P, a physician directs you to continue. So remember, stop, right? S, patient starts breathe, pulse return. T, you transfer the patient to someone at your level or higher. O, out of strength, you're exhausted, or your medical director tells you to discontinue. Out of strength does not just mean tired, but physically unable to continue. Now, foreign body airway obstruction in adults. Airway obstruction may be caused by relaxation of throat muscles, vomited or regurgitated stomach contents, blood, damaged tissue, dentures, foreign bodies. In adults, usually occurs during a meal. In children, it's usually during a meal or at play. Patient with mild airway obstruction is able to exchange ear, but with signs of respiratory distress. These patients, does, does, they do not require any interventions from you at this time. So if they have an obstruction and they have good ear exchange, all you need to do is monitor them. That's it, monitor the patient. If they have sudden severe obstruction, it's usually easy to recognize in a um, responsive patient. In unresponsive patients, suspect obstruction if maneuvers to open the airway and ventilate are ineffective. So if you open the airway and you start to try and breathe for the patient and there is resistance and you reposition and make sure you open it properly and it's still feeling resistance, then you might have a blockage. Abdominal thrust maneuver or Heimlich is recommended in respiratory responsive adults and children older than one year. Right? And um, this is for the adult that's responsive. You're going to position yourself behind the patient. It's not a good idea to use a, a, a wide stance. Well, I don't want to say wide, but not, not, don't use a stance where your legs are shoulder width apart. It's better to put one foot forward and one foot backward. And it's better to use a, a tighter grip than the hugging grip that you're observing. <clears throat> right? So it's better to have a, a grip that brings your arms closer to the patient's body where you have more control which is very difficult for me to explain. So I'll show you when we get in the classroom setting. The type of grip that is being used, if the patient goes unresponsive, you might have, a, have some issues controlling the weight of the patient. And if you have shoulder width length for your legs, he's in a bad position if the patient start to fall back on him. If I have one foot forward or one foot backward, I am in a better position to easily control the patient's weight without putting any strain on my back. And if your arms can't go around the patient, then you can't use abdominal thrust. And the point of the abdominal thrust is between the, the sternum and the navel and your putting your thumb inside so your thumb shouldn't be on the outside it should be on the inside and you compress in with the fist towards the diaphragm so you're creating an artificial cough for the patient P patient too big you may have to put them against the wall or something try to create pressure but if you're going to do that you need to have somebody on the left side and the right side of the patient in case the patient start to slide down or fall. Got to anticipate that. For your pregnant patients, again, you're going to do something that looks more like a chest thrust than an abdominal thrust. Instead of abdominal thrust maneuver, use chest thrust for the following responsive patient. Women in advanced stages of pregnancy, pregnancy and obese patients. And as I said earlier, if you cannot reach around the patient, you can do um, 
that type of technique, right? It's not gonna work. You must be able to reach around the patient. And you must be able to control that patient's body weight. You're not able to control the patient body weight. You shouldn't be in that position. Unresponsive patients with foreign body airway obstruction, adults. Determine unresponsiveness, check for breathing and pulse. If present and breathing is absent, attempt ventilation. If two attempts do not produce visible chest rise, perform 30 chest compressions, open the airway, look in the mouth. So that's really the, the difference, right? Each time you go, before you give your ventilations, you're gonna check to see if there's something in the mouth. And they can have a pulse present. Common problems. Now looking at the pediatric population, infants and children. If there are signs and symptoms of earway infection, do not waste time trying to dislodge a foreign body. Unresponsive, standing or sitting child perform Heimlich maneuver, which is the same um, abdominal thrust. An unresponsive child older than one year manage in the same manner as an adult. Infants, do not use abdominal thrust for infants. Instead, perform back slaps and chest thrusts, and it's five back slaps between the shoulder blade and chest thrusts. And ensure that you have good control of the infant, right? And you need to hold them in a way where you're supporting their neck, their head, neck, upper back, and lower back. You have to have good control of that. In unresponsive infants, begin CPR, begin with chest compressions. Do not check for a pulse before starting chest compressions. Open the airway and look in the mouth. Right? Remove the object if seen. Resume chest compressions if no object is seen. So if you suspect foreign body airway obstructions and the patient is not responding, you don't need to check for a pulse. Right? Start your, your um, chest thrust and back slaps. And you do that until the object is dislodged. Special resuscitation circumstances, opioid overdose, which is very common in the United States. Standard resuscitation measures take priority. So <clears throat> even if you suspect that it's a possible opioid or opiate overdose and naloxone is needed, you still need to do CPR. So CPR needs to be um, occurring while someone prepares the Narcon or naloxone for administration. Cardiac arrest in your pregnant patient, you might need more than one, more than two rescuers to deal with um, cardiac arrest in a pregnant patient because if you're going to have a pregnant patient flat, somebody needs to keep the fundus off the the major blood vessels. So somebody needs to be pushing the fundus more to the left side, right? Kind of need to ease pressure off that. The vena cava. And um, it may be necessary for the pregnant patient to kind of elevate the, the upper portion of the body 
to cause the diaphragm to shift down, might have trouble using a BVM on this patient. So get them on a flat surface, preferably I would go with a spine board or a CPR um, board. And um, as I say, you, can, you may have to consider ele elevating the upper portion of the body and you're gonna need somebody to kind of ease pressure of the, the vessels. So you're looking at three to four persons for CPR to be effective in your pregnant patient. Grief support for family members and loved ones. Family members may experience a psychologic, psychologic crisis that turns into a medical crisis. Family members and loved ones will remember this event in detail for the rest of their lives. Keep the family informed throughout the resuscitation process. So allow them to, to look at what is happening, right? They need to, to understand that you're doing everything or you have done everything that you could possibly do for the patient. And depending on whether or not you work for a private service, you may have to do a performance. And what that means is you know that the patient is not going to make it, but you're still going to give it your best effort. But you know, right? So you may have to put on a performance. And that's more for private companies where persons are paying out of pocket for the services. After resuscitation has stopped, helpful measures include take the family to a quiet private place, use clear language and speak in a warm, sensitive and caring manner, exhibit calm, reassuring authority, use the patient's name, use eye contact and appropriate touch. Expect emotions, whether it's good or bad. These them just lose a loved one. These persons are gonna, their family members are gonna get emotional. Your loved ones are gonna be emotional. Be supportive, but do not hover. Ask if a friend or family member can be called. Ensure that children are not ignored. Education and training for EMT. CPR skills will and can deteriorate over time. So it's something that needs to be maintained. And it doesn't mean that every two years when your certification has expired, that's when you're gonna do it again. After three months, skill will decline. You need workshops to be effective. So CPR skills should be practiced often using mannequin-based training. CPR self-instruction through a video or computer-based modules with hands-on practice may be a reasonable alternative to instructor-led courses. Online is the way forward. You are a patient advocate. You must do your part to facilitate training of lay people in critical skills of CPR and AD operation, right? So you need to be familiar with the primary service area that you're serving as an EMS responder. You need to invite the public to your EMS station or to an area that can be agreed on and we need to educate the public. And education is not just theory. We need to get them learning hands-on, right? So get out a mannequin, teach them how to do good chest compression. They don't have to learn to do good ventilation, but if they can do good chest compression, it can make a difference, a huge difference. Right? And that is something that we badly need in Jamaica. So the more people we have that, that are trained 
and know what to do and how to do it properly, the more, the better the patient's chance of survival. And if you're doing something with your community, as I said, let it be a three month thing, right? And then add something else to it. Show them how to control bleeding. Show them how to keep a, a, a person still if something is wrong with their spine. They are gonna help you to be more effective in the field. So you can't be serving a, per, a primary service area and nobody in the community know what to expect when you respond. They know what to expect, they'll be of better assistance to you. Something to think about going forward. So that is your CPR review in a nutshell.